Amen. Well, this is uh, the fourth and final um, sermon in our series, Love the Badge of the Christian. We said this every week that love is a thing that identifies a Christian to the world. Love is our badge. The text for the entire series has been from John chapter 13, verses 34 and 35. A new commandment I give to you that you love one another, just as I have loved you, you also are to love one another. By this, all people will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. Now, the past few Sundays, we've talked about agape love, which is the most powerful, noblest kind of love. It's a sacrificial love. It's the kind of love that God has for man and that man has for God, and he wants us to have for everybody. Not just our Christian brothers and sisters or our family, but he wants us to have agape love for everybody. And we've talked about the positive nature of agape love. Uh, it's patient, it's kind, it never gives up, uh, it always believes the best, it never stops hoping, never stops hoping, and it gives us the power to endure anything. And we can find that in 1 Corinthians 13.4. Love is patient and kind. Love does not envy or boast. It is not arrogant. Last week, we talked about what agape love does not do. And if we want to read uh, 1 Corinthians 13, uh, the second half of verse 4 through verse 6. Love does not envy or boast. It is not arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice at wrongdoing, but rejoices with the truth. So this week, I want to talk about the proper way to love yourself. Because it's impossible for you to love your neighbor as yourself without loving yourself first. So we need to talk about the proper way to love yourself. Now, I promise that I, I, that, I, that I don't tell Richard what my text scripture is, but the last two weeks he's hit it right on. The, the scripture that Gene read today actually is my text for today. It's from Mark chapter 28, or chapter 12, verses 28 through 31. And one of the scribes came up, so you know that's the Holy Spirit. You know that's the Holy Spirit when these kinds of things happen. And one of the scribes came up and heard them disputing one another, and seeing that he answered them well said, which commandment is the most important of all? Jesus answered, the most important is, Hear, O Israel, the, God, the Lord our God, the Lord is one, and you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, and with all your soul, and with all your mind, and with all your strength. The second is this, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. There's no other commandment greater than these. And what Jesus is talking about here is that in order to love everybody, you must first love God with everything in you, and, and, and then you must be able to love everybody else. The only way to do that is to love yourself first. Now, we Christians sometimes kind of get it backwards. We sometimes think that we are supposed to love everybody else more than we love ourselves. Uh, that's not what Scripture says. Scripture says, and we'll read it, Scripture says, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. So you got to love yourself first before you can love your neighbor in the way that God wants to love you to love your neighbor. What the scripture does say that we shouldn't consider ourselves more, shouldn't think of ourselves more highly than we ought to. We find that in, in Romans chapter 12, verse 3. It says, For by grace to me I say to everyone among you, do not think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think with sober judgment, each according to the measure of faith that God has assigned. But it doesn't say to love others more than you love yourself. It says, love others as you love yourself. Now, 
Many people have a problem with that because many of us suffer the pain of self-hatred and live each day with a feeling of intense worthlessness. This lack of proper love for ourselves makes it impossible for us to love others the way God wants us to love them. Now these two commandments uh, that, that, we, that we read today, two commandments of scripture in our reading, we can condense those into a capsule form that is the duty, total duty of humans to love God and to love their fellow human beings. These two commandments are invitations that enrich life. It enriches our lives when we love God with everything and we love our neighbors. The measure of our love for self is a measure of love that we are able to express toward our neighbor. In other words, if we love ourselves, then we're able to express our love to our neighbor. If we have a low view of self, we will have a low view and critical view of others. There's something that I read in, in preparing this sermon. It says, when a man does not love himself, he cannot love his fellow man. And when he does not understand God's love, he does not know how to love himself. Now, there's some symptoms that indicate the lack of proper love for self. I, I was in a seminar yesterday. It was a wellness, clergy wellness seminar. Uh, because clergy and ministers have a, have a problem sometimes with self-care. And so if you, don't, if you don't take care of yourself and love yourself, then you're not valuable to others, to those that you're supposed to be caring for. So uh, uh, in the seminar yesterday, it actually was another, another validation that, that the Holy Spirit wants to talk today about loving ourselves and able to love others. Now there's some symptoms that indicate the lack of proper love for ourselves. If you have a habitual tendency to belittle yourself. Now I'm not talking about not being humble. There's a difference in humility and belittling ourselves. If you, if you, have, a, if you have a habitual tendency to belittle yourself, that would indicate a lack of proper love for yourself. Do you regularly hesitate to attempt new things or difficult things? Are you characterized by a feeling of loneliness and alienation from others? Do you have a, are you characterized by a continuing flight from one person? We run from one situation to another. When things get tough, we run instead of staying, sticking, sticking in and trying to deal with it. That is a symptom that, that you may not have the proper love for yourself. And, and the most damaging one would be if you had suicidal thoughts. So those are symptoms of not having the proper love for ourselves. Now why do people lack a proper love of themselves? Now some of it has to do with our early lives. You know, some experience a lack of love or an absence of love uh, as children, as, as kids, and, and we, we begin to have a hostile attitude toward ourselves. Uh, some lack of proper love for, for self because we're constantly insulted, we're constantly assaulted by insulting criticism. That somebody's always criticizing you, constantly, 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 during your formative years of life as a, as a youth. As kids, uh, sometimes your parents will tell you, why aren't you like Johnny? Or why aren't you like Susie? Those kinds of things, constant kinds of things, will cause you not to have a proper love for yourself. Some form a low opinion of themselves when they compare themselves with others. Now, Scripture actually tells us, the Bible tells us, that those who compare themselves with others are not wise. Let's look, let's, look at, look, let's look at 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 12. 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 12. 
Not that we dare to classify or compare ourselves with some of those who are commending themselves, but when they measure themselves by one another and compare themselves with one another, they are without understanding. So when you compare yourselves with others, that's not a wise thing. And it can result in an improper love for yourself. Now, each one of us needs to recognize that we are unique and, and, it's, and it's a gift, our uniqueness is a gift from God. There's a scripture in Psalms 139, 14. Psalms 139, 14. It says, I praise you for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works. My soul knows it very well. So, you are unique. God created you uniquely. So you should love yourself. He loves you. You should love yourself. Some have a low opinion of self because, because there's some unresolved guilt in our lives. You know, guilt can be either a blessing from God or it can be a horrible curse from Satan. And when guilt comes from God, it is intended to bring about correction of our way of living or thinking. Refusing to acknowledge personal responsibility for sin leads to a guilt problem that will bring about depression and self-hate down the road. So we've got to get, take care of the unresolved guilt in our lives. Some of us have hated ourselves because we're unwilling to accept God's complete forgiveness of the sins we confess. When we confess and ask God forgiveness, he forgives us. Some of us, though, have a problem and hate ourselves and can't, and can't deal with it because we are unwilling to accept God's complete forgiveness for the sins we've confessed. We have been willing to accept God's forgiveness but we have been unwilling, on the other hand, to forgive ourselves. If you're unwilling to, either unwilling to accept God's forgiveness or to grant forgiveness for yourself, that will contribute to an inability to love yourself properly. And as I remiss said, said, I'll say it over and over again, if you don't love yourself properly, then you cannot love it your neighbor or love others as God wants you to love them. We can be absolutely certain that our enemy, the devil, will do all that he can to cause us to hate ourselves. The devil is a liar and a deceiver. Matter of fact, the name Satan means accuser. It's part of his strategy to cause us to hate ourselves. Again, hating ourselves makes it impossible for you to genuinely love God and others. So, how can we develop a proper love for self? To properly love others, we need to recognize and respond to the good news that God loves us as sinners even though he knows all about us. God loves us as, as sinners, even though he knows all about us. He knows what we've done. He knows what we think. He knows where we've been. He still loves us. He loves us more than we can imagine. He loves us. He, will, he, 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 he loves us more than, he will move the, 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 the thing that's in your way for loving him. He will move it because he loves you. You cannot stop God from loving you. Even if you try, you cannot stop him from loving you. The stuff that we do, it, it's unlovable. A lot of stuff we do is unlovable, but you cannot stop God from loving you. So remember that. So to properly love ourselves, we need to recognize 
that and respond to the good news that God loves us as sinners even though he knows all about us. Uh, John 3.16 says, For God so loved the world that he gave his Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. Romans chapter 5, verses 6 through 8, say this. God has provided forgiveness for us. John, Romans 5, 6 through 8. For while we were still weak, at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. For one will scarcely die for a righteous person, Though perhaps for a good person, one would dare even to die. But God shows his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. If God loves you that much, we should be able to love ourselves so that we can love others. Nothing is hidden from the penetrating eye of God. He knows everything. There's no secrets from him. The good news of the gospel is that God loves us and extends his grace and mercy toward us even though we are sinners. The good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ is that through him, God forgives us of all our sins and redeems us from the waste of sin. Sin is very wasteful. He redeems us from the waste of sin. The gospel is not good advice. It's good news for sinners. It's not good advice. It's good news for sinners. Try to recognize the height and the depth and the length and breadth of God's love for you. I know it's hard, but try, try to recognize it. Matter of fact, that was Paul's prayer for uh, the church in Ephesus. Uh, it's at, at uh, Ephesus, uh, Ephesians chapter 3, verses 14 through 19. Paul's desire was, was that they know how much God loved them. Ephesians 3, 14 through 19. For this reason I bow my knees before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth is named, that according to the riches of his glory, he may grant you to be strengthened with power through his spirit in your inner being, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that you, being rooted and grounded in love, may have strength to comprehend with the saints what is the breadth and length, height and depth, and to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. Try to recognize that, how much he loves you, and how, how wide and how deep that love is. And we also have to accept God's forgiveness. Uh, 1 John 1 and 9 says, accept God's forgiveness and forgive yourself. If we confess our sins, this is what John 1, 1 John 1 and 9 says, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So get rid of the guilt. Get rid of the guilt so that you can love yourself. God can be dependent on to forgive us and to cleanse us from everything that separates us from him. So by faith, we need to accept this gift. By faith, we need to respond to the truth that God holds our sins against us no longer. We need to accept the truth that God has accepted us into his family as dear children, no matter what we've done, no matter who we are, because of Jesus' sacrifice and our, and, and our faith in that sacrifice, God has accepted us into his family as his, his children. 1 John chapter 3, verses 1 through 3 say this. See what kind of love the Father has given us that we should be called children of God. And so we are. The reason why the world does not know us is that it does not know him. Beloved, we are God's children now, 
And what we will be has not yet appeared, but we know that when he appears, we shall be like him, because we shall see him as he is, and everyone who thus hopes in him purifies himself as he is pure. Now Jesus sought to help people overcome anxiety by encouraging them to evaluate themselves from God's viewpoint. Now he urged his disciples to take a lesson from the sparrows and the lilies. If we go to Matthew chapter 6, verses 26 through 29. Look at the birds of the air. They neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not of more value than they? And which of you, being anxious, can add a single hour to his span of life? And while you anxious about clothing, consider the lilies of the field, how they grow, they neither toil or spin. Yet I tell you, even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. The God who loves the birds of the air and the plants of the field loves us and will help us to be what he meant us to be if we trust him day by day. He also said we should accept ourselves because being anxious and worrying will not help us add one inch to our height or one hour to our length of our, to the length of our life. And which of you being anxious can add a single hour to a span of life? If then you are not able to do a small thing as that, why are you anxious about the rest? That's in, in Luke chapter 12, verses 25 and 26. So by God's grace, let us accept and love ourselves as we are. We need to dedicate ourselves to something bigger than ourselves. The person who's wrapped up in self is a mighty small package. If you're wrapped up in yourself, that's a mighty small package. If we were truly appreciate and love and respect ourselves, let us give ourselves to the service of God and to a ministry of helpfulness to others. In doing so, we can appreciate the people that we are. In order to love as God wants you to love, you must first love yourself. If you don't love yourself, then you cannot love as God would have you love. If you don't love yourself, you're not taking care of yourself. If you don't love yourself, you're not effective in your ministry. It'll come across as phony. Love yourself, not more than others. I mean, not more than others. Do not love yourself more than others. But love yourself first, and you can love others. Do not love others more than you love yourself, because you can't do that. I don't think you can do that. I don't think you can love somebody else more than you can love yourself. If that's possible, I don't know. Doesn't seem possible to me. So love yourself, and then you can love others. Don't think of yourself more highly than you ought, but think of yourself as important because you're important to God. You're so important to God that he sent his son to die for you. You're so important to God that he, that he covers all of the bad stuff you've done, covers it up and forgives you. He loves you that much. There's nothing that can stop him from loving you. Nothing you do can stop it. So, that means you're very, very important to him. Where we read today, you're fearfully and wonderfully made. God made you unique 
to love yourself and then we can love others. You know, God loves you. He really loves you. He's proven it by the gift of his son, Jesus Christ. And he continues to show that love through the ministry of the Holy Spirit. Now, you can demonstrate your love for yourself, okay, by making Jesus Christ the Lord of love in your life. You can make him the Lord and leader of your life. You can demonstrate your love of yourself by doing that. Love yourself and then you can love everybody else the way that God wants you to love them. I mentioned earlier in the, in, in, in the message the good news of the gospel. The good news of the gospel is that Jesus Christ came to this earth to die for you, to sacrifice himself for you so that you could be forgiven of your sin. That's how much God loves you. And you can experience God's love but not being a Christian, you can experience God's love by being able to breathe and go out in the sun and go to the beach. You can experience the love of God for mankind, but you cannot experience the love that God has for you as a child until you become one of his children through our faith in Jesus Christ. I made this comment in, in Bible study. God is fa fatherly in because he provides the sun and the rain and the wind. So that's fatherly. Right? But God, but, but to experience God as father, you must be, become one of his children. So there's anyone here today that wants to experience that kind of love, it's an amazing, a powerful Love. I can't really explain it, uh, but I feel it, and it allows me to love others. So if you want to experience that kind of love and don't have it, you can get it today by accepting Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. So if anyone who hasn't done that today and would like to do that, come down, and we'll do that. If you're shy and don't want to come down front, then you can see me afterwards. And we can talk about it. And you can still experience God's love through his invitation of eternal life. Anybody here who's looking for a church home? It's a great place. I say it every week. I say it because I mean it. It's a great place to come and, and experience the love and experience the love of God. This is a great place for that. So if you're looking for love in all the right places, this is a place for you. So come down if you uh, are looking for a church home. Okay? Well, may the grace of God, the endurance and encouragement, grant you to live in such harmony with one another in accord with Christ Jesus, that together you may, with one voice, Glorify God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen.